City Council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. Thursday night, you're in the comp center with Drew Breezy, where we discuss really heavy subjects, but in a light and uh, fancy free way. If you want to call in to comm center tonight, you're going to want to reach out to us at 848-COM-911. That's 848-COM-911. That is our phone number. You can call in to us live and be on the show. We're actually going to get to calls here in just a minute. If you want to leave us a voicemail throughout the week, if you're listening at an odd hour, you can dial 848-COM-911. Leave us a voicemail. As long as it's brief, we will play it on the show. Drew, how are you doing? Drew, are you alive still? Yeah, I am. Did I disappear on you? Am I? You did. Uh, Welcome to the Comm Center with Drew Breezy. This is Drew Breezy. Go ahead, Drew. <laughs> hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm alive. I'm well. I traveled this weekend. Um, I went to uh, I went back home to Western New York. A lot of uh, I know there are people in here that are familiar with that area, that neck of the woods. And anywho, um, I, I got to see my mom, who is in a home up there, um, a, uh, you know, like a, uh, what do they call those things, John? Uh, 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 a convalescent home, a old folks home. House. Yeah, just a, a convalescent home, uh, I guess you would call it. Uh, an assisted living facility, I guess you would call it. She's, uh, she's definitely a little bit older than I am, at least by uh, 14 years. And she is um, <clears throat> recovering there, uh, where, or, or her days are waning there, shall I say. Uh, she... Well, I'm sure. I'm sorry that's happening, Drew. Thoughts and prayers with your mom. I'm, I'm gone away. Uh, am I you're, back? You're back here, Drew. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I... I, I I appreciate that. I mean, it's, uh, she's had a good full life and, and, um, you know, it was just great to see her and she, she knew who I was. It's not, uh, that acute yet, but we definitely have the same conversation within the same conversation, if that makes sense. Uh, a buddy I used to work with, used to joke with me out of all, all the time. And he used to say she can hide her own Easter eggs, Yeah, which I think is, uh, something to brag about. But she's a, a loving, wonderful mother, and uh, the three boys were there with her uh, this weekend. So, you know, she got to see us, and and uh, hopefully she'll she'll be around for when I get up there next time. But um, so that's what that's that. I mean, I had uh, very strange experiences on Delta Airlines, and since I have known you, since I've been associated with you, I have had nothing but bad luck traveling uh, on airplanes. And I'm pretty sure it's your fault. How, <clears throat> again, we're working through technical difficulties, and it's always with the sound for some reason. Um, so sound not important is, on a podcast. That's fine. Don't worry about the sound. <laughs> that's right. I I do believe that uh, it, it is uh, good that you have a great beard. And again, as always, we're going to do a, a little survey in the chat. Please put a one in the chat if you think John's beard is weak, and if you think John's beard is strong, please. Uh, put a one. Now, the other thing that we uh, have done since we last spoke, I don't know if the volume has increased or if it's worse or what's going on. Um, however, what uh, there was a podcast that was released over the week, and it was done by our very good friend. Uh, the, the title of the podcast is uh, On Being a Police Officer. I strongly suggest you listen to the back episodes and to the, the, the most current release. Uh, Abby Ellsworth is our friend. She's a mutual friend. She's a great friend of the show. She's done collaborations with us before. Um, if you want to check out. If you want to check that out, you can look for on being a police officer, wherever you get your podcasts. Yes. And she interviewed you. Uh, and it was a great episode. And I was so 
so impressed with both of you, both of your, her ability to evoke the emotion out of you because you are um, somewhat of an em emotionless dolt. And, Dead to uh, the world, cool. not that smart. Yeah, definitely not charismatic. I'm definitely more charismatic when not in person, which is why I succeed in podcasts, but not in real life. Right. And you did remind everybody that I, I call you, I, I call it summoning. I summoned you every morning with a rude phone call just to minimize your existence and to let you know that you're only here because of me, basically. So I'm I'm glad that you shared that with everybody. Uh, but that's I'm not even a that's not even a joke. That's so true. But you know, your morning phone calls are having much less of an impact now that I'm on overnight shift, and you're calling me first thing in the morning when I'm just trying to go to sleep. So maybe you want to call me at more like you know six p.m. or something. That's when I wake up. <laughs> it's a uh, it's kind of like a lullaby for for you. It's like the last thing you hear before you go to sleep, and you can. Um, just kind of drift off to sleep. And I appreciate that. Drift off to my so, nightmares. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some people wake to nightmares and you, you actually fall asleep to nightmares, which is odd, but commendable. Once again, uh, if you want to call into the show, dial 848-COM-911. Right now there's no waiting. 848-COM-911. You can be on the show with Drew Breezy. If there's anything you ever wanted to tell him and believe me, like, you know, this is your chance to tell him what you think of him. He'll have to take it live on the air in front of everyone. Uh, Drew, what do we got going on in the news? Oh, we got some uh, situations going on in Austin, of all places. Um, listen, I, I if you haven't, uh, if you don't follow me on social media, I, I understand why. Uh, there's only you can only get so much of me. But um, today there was a, a little article that I saw somewhere, or a little post that I saw somewhere, and I was like, man, this it just struck me. Um, because I think that we have way too many people in this world that are running their organizations and or law enforcement agencies in particular, uh, just based on buzzwords and based on, um, and, and look, I'll come right out and say DEI, like uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am not anti any of those things whatsoever. What I am pro, though, is if you're qualified for the position, let's do it. I took a page almost literally out of Stu Scheller, Lieutenant Colonel Stu Scheller's book, and he talks about, like, listen, <laughs> we get the idea of, of equality. Everybody should be treated equal. We should all just be good humans and not shit human beings. Um, but to... Elevate people on the just based on the color of their skin or their appearance, uh, I think is a very slippery slope because, as he aptly points out, he's talking about going to war. He was a Marine lieutenant colonel, and, and they were putting pe you know people in positions of command that perhaps weren't qualified to do it or weren't the best qualified candidate. Let's put it that way. So they were doing it just based on appearance or, or sex or, or race or in, in some cases, sexual orientation. Um, I, I still haven't quite figured this out. And it, believe me, there is nobody friendlier to any community than me because I just don't give a shit about you as, unless you start talking about your sexual experiences in front of me for God knows what reason. But this, this is exactly my point. Like, just because you bang <laughs> somebody in the same you know, male or female class as you, it, it doesn't really put you ahead of anybody else. You should have the exact same opportunity everybody else has, which means you should have the exact same opportunity to impress or to study and, and succeed or to uh, develop yourself through leadership development. And when you start sprinkling in these three little letters, DEI, uh, I think it complicates matters beyond uh, what they need to be in public safety specifically. What do we need to be in public safety specifically, Drew? I'm sorry? What do we need to be in public safety specifically? You got froze up there a little bit. Uh, in public safety, we just need to make sure that our authority doesn't overshadow our service. And, it, it, you know, the 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 community actually does pay our salary 
and you have to understand that and appreciate that. But the community also under has to understand that we are the experts when it comes to law enforcement, and we need to um, govern accordingly, right? So we need to implement the programs that we think are important. And once you've caved to the mob, once you've caved to mob rule, like they're doing in California now where, you know, it's it hasn't passed, but there's proposed legislation to rid uh, canines, you know, from police departments because it, it reminds people of slave patrols or it's, that's not the intended purpose. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> here we go. I'm, I'm about to get on a rant, but um, I, I think, I think comparing canine officers to slave patrols is doing slaves a disservice. I think that when you, the, the reason for dogs, if, if that actually happened, the slave patrols use dogs to, to round up slaves. And that's what supposedly is triggering uh, the, the black, people you know that that are proposing this legislation so here we go they're they're worried about this so they're comparing themselves they're comparing felons who are running away from the police and actively trying to hide people who have committed crimes in the black community people who committed crimes in in any community whatever um that doesn't matter but specifically targeting the black community the, all the canine is trying to do is catch the the felon so when you stand behind a podium and you say, this is reminiscent of slave patrols rounding up slaves, you're saying that slaves and felons are on the same plane. And I don't think that that's fair. I think that, that, that slaves were encamped. The slaves were literally enslaved. That's where you get the word from. And that's what they were escaping. They were escaping freedom. Whereas somebody who is running from police after committing a felony is running from responsibility. They're running from what <laughs> they're running from their own accountability. And I, I don't think that the two are on the same plane. That's that's just my opinion. So here we go. We're gonna talk about this this article because it, it has relevance in um, Austin police. I don't know if you got to see the clip. I can show it to you in a little bit. There was uh, some type of street racing event in Austin and several officers showed up and at one point the crowd just grew angry, and they ran the police off. And it's been my understanding that that's, that's what's happening in Austin. This, this kind of, we're focused on buzzwords, we're not necessarily focused on community safety, or maybe we are, but y you know what I mean, maybe we're, we're allowing the mob to govern a little bit more than we should. So it says some Austin city council members are speaking out about the police department's vacancies and the ongoing problems at the 911 call center um, after uh, a, a very chaotic scene unfolded in downtown on Saturday night. Street racers took over the intersection at South Lamar Boulevard and Barton Springs Road, drifting in the middle of the street, setting off fireworks, and throngs of people looked on in the mayhem. One law enforcement officer was injured. Several police cars were damaged. Just imagine for a moment uh, that the incidents last night happened on a large scale where a large scale event was going. Council member Mackenzie Kelly said nothing that she is increasingly concerned about or uh, it, it, noting that she is increasingly concerned about our police vacancies. So the article goes on to talk about um, the police vacancies trickling down to the 911 communications area. It, it's it. Even when, you know, even when I was in it, and we're talking about 1992, that's when I first got in it, there was a very high attrition rate. There was a very high turnover rate in 911 slash dispatching. It's, uh, it's a pretty, um, pretty demanding job for, um, the, for a lack of recognition of how demanding it is. I, I don't know how else to put that, but uh, it'll burn you out pretty quick. And, um, so that's kind of what this article is talking about. Like Austin, you're going to run through people. If you don't have them, if you don't have happy employees um, and, and people are, nobody wants to go to work where the, the, the officers are understaffed, the 911 is understaffed. Nobody wants to go to work where somebody is potentially going to be hurt. Uh, nobody wants that responsibility. You can go make money elsewhere doing something with uh, maybe one one thousandth of the trauma that you endure. Do you experience um, 
workplace shortages where you are? I'm actually extremely lucky that uh, the agency that I work for boasts one of the lowest turnover rates in the state. My boss is routinely called upon to ask what he's doing right in our agency. Uh, for about four years, I was actually the new guy. Like just no one, there was no vacancies, no need to replace me. But I can imagine how bad it would be. You know, when I when I used to work for the state at the state penitentiary, um, we we always had problems all the time. And a huge amount of stress was caused by the fact that we didn't have enough people working there, but also that we didn't have adequate people working there. One of the biggest problems that you breed when you are understaffed is that, well, eventually you, you just want a warm body in the chair. And what you're doing is you're intentionally importing liability and toxic people, which ruins it for the rest of everyone. So I can just imagine what, what they're going through down there in Austin for 911 operators. In terms of the police and them being concerned about vacancies, I'm surprised the vacancies aren't working to the advantage of the Austin City Council since they defunded the police by 33 percent. And That's what's right. interesting to me about this incident with the street racers is we've turned a corner, in my opinion. You know, we no longer we no longer need to have some charade that this is about police brutality or the unjust treatment of someone or no knock warrants or positional asphyxia or any of the other actual issues. Now it's just we're going to have fun in Austin. We're going to do what we want to do. And we know the police are impotent to stop us. I can't wait until there's an actual problem in Austin and the people decide that they're actually angry and they want to get rowdy. I mean, this was a good time if it was street racing and fireworks and we had all of that go to hell. So I can only I can only just wait for the next shoe to drop, the next major police issue, the next reason for people to feel justified to go out there and take to the streets when this is what happens when they're just having fun. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I just... <clears throat> nobody wants to work in a place like that. And, and I, you know, like I, I'm not going to go on and on about it, but the, you know, this, if the citizenry is like the police aren't welcome here. Well, how about the uh, 85 to 90% of the public who stays silent when the, the 10 or 15% are so loud, you know, the ones the that just pay their taxes and go to work and deserve to have <clears throat> protection and deserve to not have, uh, somebody overdose of fentanyl in their uh, driveway or uh, just to be generally protected um, from burglaries or robberies or sexual batteries or whatever the crime. I'll, I'll say, though, that I'm 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 sick of the silent majority. You know, that was a phrase first started by Nixon when he wanted to talk about who was really in command of the culture because you had a loud counterculture in the 60s and 70s. And what he said was that most people were not out there protesting and most people weren't out there rabble rousing. Most people, you know, were working and keeping to themselves and putting food on their on their dinner table every single night and kind of keeping their shoulder to the grindstone and working. Well, I'm sick of the silent majority. You know, we're losing this culture war in this country to the point now where we no longer have law and order. We're we're at the point now where 400 years of Western jurisprudence is being set aside. We've had police departments in this country now for 300 years, going back, I believe, to Boston PD. And we're at the point now where we have so little respect for the police that we don't have police protection. We don't we don't have law and order in our society. If there's a silent majority out there, it's time to stop being silent because you you can sit here and you can sit on the sidelines and watch the world go by and decide that, you know, you want to protect your family and you want to do all these things that are noble things. But once law and order is gone, once there's no more police protection for our society, you're only doing yourself a disservice by being a, by being in the silent majority. You've got to go out there and you've got to attend these city council meetings. I'm not saying you should go out there and protest, but you should get involved. And the people in this show, you know, Abby Ellsworth and others, you know, she's engaging with uh, modern police politics. Our fans are obviously very interested in that. They subscribe to this show, which is another way that, you know, we at least debate the issue. But there's plenty of people out there that sit on the sidelines and have made really no opinion about this as their society crumbles beneath them. Drew. Yeah, I agree. I, I do understand the sentiment, but I, I do. Um, and this isn't even a cheap shot, but, um, you know, if that protest is during the day uh, for the for the uh, the counter counter culture to show up, well, generally the counter counter culture is working. So it's not always that easy, but uh, I, I do agree that you need to, you, you got to fight for your right to party, right? Um, yes. That, that song was always meant ironically. So I always love it. Every time that I hear it, the beastie boys were making fun of the frat mentality and, and yet you hear people play that song somewhat sincerely. I, I, 
I love that. Almost like Sting's uh, Every Breath You Take being a song about stalking. Yep. You know, yeah, many, there's so many interesting songs from the 80s and 90s, and uh, we should probably just change the format of this podcast to be about that. Oh, I'm, I'm down with that. Speaking of sounds, hey, we have some, uh, if you want to call us, it's 848-266-6911. That's 848-COM-911. I'd love for you to join the conversation. We had one caller at the beginning of the show, but he's gone. Um, and I understand why. I, I don't mean to chase anybody away, but. Uh, we do tend to uh, walk a, uh, a, a tightrope of technical issues at times without a net sometimes. Uh, but we can enjoy people who have called in the past, like someone named 107 Canoe. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey, Com Center. It is not 107 Canoe Guy. Um, it is 3 a.m. And I thought I'd leave you a voicemail. I just listened to episode 254, Com Center. And, uh, yeah, what you mentioned there about brevity, just wanted to say sorry. I, uh, I typed this one out. Um, <laughs> so I will get to it lickety split, as it were. Uh, so the live 911 is a terrible idea. Uh, the rural areas, such as where I work, that don't have any uh, cell phone coverage or anything like that will suffer greatly. Um, it's hard that as soon as I leave, like even my little uh, town here, uh, the radio doesn't even work. So it's really dangerous to leave the area and we have a vast area. So anyway, uh, another point here, I uh, just wanted to share that one of the worst calls for wasting dispatch time uh, that I got was early on in my career, a person called 911 to say, um, hey, there's an old lady that needs help crossing the street. She looked like she was really struggling, but I don't have time. My time's too precious to help her out. I know the police have lots of time on their hands, so the police should be going to help her. That was probably the strangest call that I ever got, and uh, let's just say that Dispatch was not happy with that. Keep up the great job, guys. Really appreciate the show. So my call. apologies to you, Drew. I described him as 10-7 Canoe Guy, which just shows you what a wonderful listener I am, and we all know that listening is not a required skill of a 911 dispatcher. I have a feeling that was our other friend up in Canada who is not 10-7 Canoe. If he could uh, come up with a handle, though, that we could call him by, that would probably be good. I think, uh, to avoid confusion, we will just call him not 10-7 Canoe. Not 10-7 um, Canoe, okay. And here is a second voicemail. Hey, calm set. Hey, Com Center, how's it going? Give you guys a call, leave a message quick. One thing that I don't think we really talk about as uh, dispatch, uh, dispatchers, police officers, uh, first responders is I know that I've only been doing this for about six years now, but lots of people say, oh, I wanted to do that job or I could have done that job or you meet people that are like doing hotel security or mall security or something like that and they keep on saying things like yeah well i just i'm just getting experience for the job and people thinking what they need to go to the academy or pass interviews and stuff and i think there's this misconception general misconception of like now is a great time to get into policing because no one wants to do it and everywhere is really hurting right so take me for example i didn't really want to i never even considered being a police officer oh what happened Am I still here? <laughs> You're still here, but I'm going to tell you, I don't know what went on with that one because I, I edited it, but we've been trying to play that phone call for a couple of weeks. I'm just going to tell you this guy's story because I've listened to it so much and my heart just broke for him because he just wants to be on the show and he can never tell the crux of his story. So what he said was he knows all these people that do hotel security and all these other kind of like, you know, jobs that sort of prime your resume for, for law enforcement. But for him, he was a barista before now. And he, he just, someone said, hey, are you interested in joining the local police department? And so he said, what the hell? I'll get into it. And he likes his job in many ways. In some ways he doesn't like it, but he encourages people out there that now really is a good time to get into law enforcement, unfortunately, for some bad reasons. But if you are interested in pursuing that career of civil service, you can go after that now. And maybe it doesn't matter what your background is. I know as a correctional officer, we employed a lot of people from many different backgrounds. And I honestly thought that was a very good thing because there were so many different kinds of personalities and there were so many different kinds of people that could talk. 
um, people with different backgrounds and experiences. And maybe if you were talking with an inmate or trying to control a situation and it wasn't working for you, you just tag team that shit. You honestly, you just knew another officer would get along better with this guy based on his personality, his experiences or what they had in common. And you would just, you would honestly, you would keep control of that situation better by handing it over to someone who could do that. And so whatever your background is, I encourage you to go into law enforcement because you're not necessarily excluded because you don't have the the most uh, pristine resume. Give it a shot. Right. <clears throat> it is a good time to get into it because uh, I, I would think the advancement within the next 10 years or so, uh, within the next five to 10 years, actually would probably, you know, you're probably going to accelerate in that field right now. Uh, if you're already in it, hang in there. I mean, I completely understand if you wanted to leave just based on the way law enforcement has been treated over the past couple of years. And, and, you know, I've been screaming it from the mountaintops. Abby's been helping me, you know, push the, the uh, word about the media's kind of uh, evil agenda of, uh, uh, of shaping people's minds when it comes to law enforcement. And um, I, I don't see, a big difference between using stereotypes for race and sex versus using stereotypes for professions. It's, it's kind of the exact same thing. I, I just, I, I don't understand why uh, we can't look at the content of character uh, because somebody very wise once said that, that that's, that was his dream that he wanted, you know, people to do that. But I believe that was so, Zeno of CCM. Yeah. We have uh, two callers on the line. Did you want to bring on a phone call? why not uh we're gonna go with um how about this one first micah are you there i am here drew how are you oh I, i'm great you you have the voice of an angel you, you have uh salt and pepper pipes I, I made that term up i don't know what it means but man that's what it sounds like. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear John. John can definitely hear you. But how are you and how is okay, Calm? Yeah. I'm doing well. I just spent the day with Calm. I just worked like uh, my normal four days. I'm off tonight and then I'm working the next six in a row. So oh. spent the day with family. I'm out doing doing stuff tonight. And you, John said you didn't have any callers, so I figured I would call in. We do get rather lonely and uh you, you are always there to pick us up and i always appreciate that uh micah you are uh definitely one of my heroes what what is your association with western new york uh i'm actually from the southern tier so south of the uh, buffalo metro area i'm sure you're familiar with but probably not a lot of the listeners most um, definitely so familiar with the yeah i agree yeah, so Western New York, I mean, much like yourself, closer to Canada and Ohio than New York City. So yeah. not what most people think. With, yeah, uh, I, I, living in New York. And then I moved out to the Southwest almost a decade ago now, about seven eight years ago. Uh, just about everybody uh, wise that I know from Western New York lives in a different state. Anywho, um, <laughs> and I'm sure you've had the same experience. Uh, and <clears throat> by the way, we landed on uh, Monday um, and we were driving back home. My lovely fiance and I were driving back home and right in front of us was a, uh, a pickup truck with a Buffalo Bill sticker on it here in Tampa. Like it, it was like, we just came from there. It, like it's everywhere. Kind of. And of course, you know, everybody loves the Buffalo Bill yeah, now because they're decent. Right. Yes. I mean, much like the, um, uh, there's a lot of Cowboys fans out here, a fan base that's been desperately needing some success, but been loyal. For years, so hell yeah. I, America's team. You don't need to worry about me cheating on you. I've been loyal to the Buffalo bills for over 20 years. So, <clears throat> uh, John just yelled, yelled, hell yeah, America's team. And for that, I, uh, I'm going to get minimized everybody. Yeah. I just minimized him because he, because they beat the bills in the super bowl. <laughs> I think six times straight. Uh, Michael, uh, Micah, thank you for calling in. I didn't mean to call you Michael, but my, because that is my nephew and you are oh. not my nephew. So Micah, thank you. Unless were you birthed by my sister-in-law by chance? Uh, I am going to uh, put you back in the queue. Thank you again for calling. Thank you for curing loneliness. We are definitely going to uh, 
need you in the future to do what you just did tonight. Do we have Keith on the line? I thought he was waiting. We have Chief Keith on the line, but we also still have Micah on the line because hey, Micah, um, he can't hear me. <laughs> there are uh, Micah. I'm going to put you in the thing here. Um, there are options uh, to drop the call or to talk, and uh, I had dropped the call on Chief Keith, and uh, I uh, hit talk on Micah. So we were stuck on Micah for a minute. Speaking of Micah, uh, microphone. Uh, while we wait for Chief Keep to call back in, let's let's discuss, John. Uh, April, what's the date again? April something. It's April twelfth. Uh, he's he just sent me a, a very vicious text two weeks in a, wo- a row about getting hung up on. He says, "Oh my gosh, I can't even re- repeat what he just said." Uh, he's very <laughs> mad that the button is called the dump button. I'm texting him right now. Please call for the love of God. Uh, Chief, if you're out there, we don't do this to you intentionally, although I get why you think that because you're a firefighter that we're constantly trying to get you to shut up. I guarantee you that's just dispatch. Like, it's kind of our gut feeling is we always kind of want to silence you. I'm not trying to take out, not trying to take out years of anger. Are you there? Yeah, you won't be able to hear Jonathan. And he was, he was ranting. He was apologizing up and down. You know me. I'm not going to apologize to the mom. You, um... <clears throat> you were able to call back by hitting redial. It really wasn't that much effort. I do apologize for hitting the wrong button, though, uh, because we know if <laughs> I if, if visualize I, what was happening, <laughs> if a law enforcement officer hits the wrong button, it's it's a simple callback. If a firefighter hits the wrong button, who knows what can happen? I do know what can happen. You will burn the microwave popcorn. Chief Keith, how are things in Cincinnati? Things are good. We had a, a glorious day of like 73 degrees today, not a cloud in the sky. And then tomorrow morning, it's going to be 29 degrees. So yeah. we're riding a roller coaster of emotions and weather. We um, Sounds if, warm. I, all I wanted to do was be in snow, to be honest. And uh, it was gorgeous, just like Chief Keefe des- described just a second ago. It was a little chilly, but not much. Um, and it was gorgeous. And then unseasonably warm for November. Yeah, yeah, and unse- uh, seasonably, unseasonably warm. And then the minute I landed, of course, they got socked with a snowstorm. <laughs> How you fellas doing tonight? We are doing great. Uh, I see that uh, you are going to have Bronson Arroyo on your uh, podcast, and I'm proud of you. Um, and Thank you, sir. What else do you have going? We're having uh, a congressman from, you know, from this area uh, on tomorrow. And then uh, we are doing a watch party on Sunday for a friend of ours. that's going to be airing on American Idol uh, Sunday night. So we're having a watch party and we're going to interview him on the podcast prior to. So it should be should be a fun little weekend. Are you seeing a, an increase of illness with uh, and, and I'm not joking uh, with the. Um... Uh, the the stuff that happened, you know, with the the controlled burn that took place. We we aren't seeing anything here. They apparently opened up the uh, opened up the water gates again. They closed them down for like three or four days down on the river, but uh, they've opened those back up. Everybody was you know scurrying for bottled water. I was actually up in Detroit when it happened, um, but my my girlfriend was like, "Hey, people are you know buying stores out of bottled water." So I mean. That that whole that whole thing's a mess, and I don't en- envy anybody up there, and I especially don't envy the guys that were working that night because the videos that I saw, I was like, I, that is horrendous. Yeah, I, I was going to kind of ask about that. I mean, I, I don't know what you know or how much you know, but I, I, you know, when they a controlled burn is, it, it's obviously done for a reason to to burn off some of the toxins. And who's right in the middle of the toxins? It's the firefighters. I mean, the the canaries in the coal mine, so to speak. So, um. You know, have you ever run into a situation like that, or not? Not with a controlled burn. I mean, I've been on, you know, several. You know, in 23 years, I've been on several hazmat fires and, and whatnot. And it's, you know, get back as far as you can. Make sure you're, you know, make sure you're upwind, and you know, just try to protect yourself the best you can. I mean, the technology has gotten much better. You know, we've got all different kinds of masks that we can put on now, and you know, and and we ran into that even, you know, different topic, but even with COVID. You know, I, I, we were issued, you know, through federal funding, you know, four different types of masks to wear. So, 
the technology has gotten much, much better, but you know, it's still, I mean, you can only protect yourself so much. Right. Well, uh, and when you look at long, long-term health effects with firemen and then, you know, even, exactly. even police officers, yeah. you know, the, the, and you're, you're hitting the mental stuff really hard, which is great, but you know, we have, you know, absorption, you know, cancer and all that type of stuff, you know, stress, the uh, heart attacks. So this just is trying the... to protect yourself and get to retirement, man. The, the, these are some of the things that people don't, you know, the, the common population doesn't think about, you know, um, this, this will put, this adds years to your life. And not to mention, like, you know, we deal with hurricanes quite often here. You know, John deals with uh, snowstorms in uh, Alabama where he is. But um, just the fact that you're there trying to manage a disaster, so to speak, and you have it's not like you don't have a family at home that you're worried about right all right listen and i didn't mean i didn't mean to jump off topic because i was on the i'm on the boo-boo bus tonight at work so we were coming back for a run when you guys were starting so i had to listen to what you guys were talking about so hopefully no pun intended didn't derail you no that's a bunch of uh fireman jargon and i don't understand it but uh chief keith i really appreciate you calling in uh, I want you to make sure that you stand upwind from Herking, and uh, we will see you in April. <laughs> Thanks for calling. We'll All see right. you in April, my man. Okay. If you guys uh, want to hear more of Chief Keefe, you can listen to One More and I'm Out of Here, which is a podcast that he does out of uh, Cincinnati at the Varsity Bar there. It's always a good show. They don't always tackle specifically the same stuff that we do, but they're friends of the show, and it's always a good listen. We're going to play a couple of excerpts from uh, 911 calls of, uh, of a, a Walmart active shooter that occurred in Springfield, Ohio. Is that right? I, I always screw this up. No, 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 no. It was in Indiana. I'm sorry. It was in Indiana. There were several shootings that we were going to cover. One of them was in Chesapeake, Virginia. I don't know that we're going to get to that one because uh, that was a night manager and several people were uh, killed in that incident unfortunately and it was it was at a walmart there it was a it was a store full of people but um he had beef with uh with the people that he worked with the shooter did um there was also uh, an incident in omaha which we'll probably touch on briefly but let's uh take a listen to what we want to what we discussed and what we want you to pay attention to is the amount of uh, like the volume of calls that come in over 911 during an active shooter incident like this, and mind you, they're coming in at different positions, so somebody is um, like having to quarterback this and try to put everything together. John, do you have anything to add before I press play here? No, I say let's uh, just dive right on into it. We can break it down. All right. This is your favorite part. It is. Anybody there? We're at Westside Walmart. There's an active shooter. Active shooter 911. Okay. Oh my God. How many shooters are there? One shooter. He's a big black guy. Okay. Are you in the, at the Westside Walmart? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, are, ma'am. All right. How many shots have been fired? One. He shot a girl in the head. He shot in the head? Okay. Yes. Uh, and you said it's a large black male? Big, large, and black male. Ron Mosley. His name is Ron Mosley. Ron Mosley? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. We'll get all the help out there. Think Ron Mosley. Okay. Can I stand the line with you? They hit, they ran, I huh? think they ran out in towards the store. Okay. Has shot someone in the head? Yes. The girl shot in the head. I'm pretty sure she got shot in the head. Okay. Okay. Um, we got him on the way. Okay. Okay. Where okay. is he now? We're, he's somewhere in the store. We don't know. He's still in the store? <laughs> Yes, he took off for a guy. He took off for a guy. He what? He took off for a guy that he's been not friends with. They he's chasing after another him. male? Where, you know where they went? Yes. They, I don't know. We ran out the right room to the left, and they went to the right. I don't know. Okay. They're in the store? Okay. Or in, they're in the store. The lady said that in the store. Okay, you did so good. This has to be so scary. We're getting all the help out there. Okay, we're in the back of the store right now. Well, I thought you ran out of the store. Yeah, so I'm out of the store. Okay, okay. All right, we'll get him out there. Okay, the wait. there's like three of us back here. Three, four of us back oh, here in the very back. Oh, wait, are you inside? 
I'm outside. Oh. You ran out the party. Okay. So. All right. Just run far away so you don't see him, okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you. 911. Yeah, I've got an active shooter at the uh, okay. at the Walmart uh, West. West Side Walmart. Okay. Do you see yeah. him still? Uh, no, he was in the break room taking shots at the people. Okay, so what, you last saw him in the break room? Yeah. Okay, all right. You know if he's still in the break room? I don't know. I, I bolted out as soon as okay. I got the chance. Okay, all right. We've got him on the way. Just get far away and just wait for the officers, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm on. Yeah, we have an active shooter at Walmart. Uh, we're, we're employees on that. We're in, in the office. Okay, uh, he just He's still in the building. Okay, I understand. Stay on the phone with me. Okay, so you guys are okay. still in Walmart? Yeah, yeah, we're still in Walmart. We're in the back. We're in the back office. Okay, are you locked in there? Yeah. Are you an employee? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're in the, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, he knows where we are. Okay, so you're in the back office. That's where the shooter is? Yeah, we're in the back office. Really. He's right at the door. In the back office area? Okay, where's that at? Yeah, we have... Straight back. It's back behind the okay. towels. I don't know. It's okay, what is he doing? Building. He's just staring at us ominously. I don't okay. know. You can see him? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know if you were locked in. Okay, so explain to me. Where, I know you're in the office. Is he in the office with you? No, no, he's outside the door. The office is locked. Okay, but you see the window? Yes. Okay, he, wh where is he right now? I don't know. He walked away from the window. Okay, just walked away from the back office. Just keep yeah. it closed, keep it barricaded as best you can, put stuff in front of the door, and just stay back away, away from it, okay? Yeah, uh, there's nothing can really... No, if there's any... All the tables are mounted. Okay, whatever you can do to Some sort of barricade the door. Okay, you guys are doing uh, great. You're doing great. We're getting them out there. That we have one employee that's... She, she's been shot in the face. We're waiting on an ambulance. Okay, is she in the office with you? Yes. Okay. Okay, just keep keep helping her. There's nothing There's nothing we can do for her. No, no. Nope. Nope. Just if there's pressure, you can apply to the wound. Uh, okay, just tell me what you're seeing if he comes back up that way, okay? Okay, I don't see him anymore. Okay. Okay, we've got out. Okay, okay. Uh, I, see, I, see, uh, I see police. I see police. Okay, I'll let you go. Okay. I have the active shooter. <clears throat> oh, hold on. That might be the right. You're in the Walmart on the west side. Active shooter in Walmart on the west side. Black guy named Ron. Please hurry. He's already shot some people. A man. <sighs> Okay, not. Uh, that was another 911 caller. So, John, what are your observations? Here? First of all, I just want to remark that it's very easy for us to kind of sit back and listen to all of these calls in series. But just remember, as this is happening, we've discussed this before on a show, all these calls are coming in more or less simultaneously. You know, as soon as someone fires a shot and other people are able to realize what's going on, that there's an active shooter, that they're all dialing 911. And so you'll hear in the call takers, especially as you go forward in series, you know, they'll answer 911 and, the, and then, then someone will say there's a, a shooter and they'll say, are you talking about the shooter in Walmart? Because they already want to skip over the primary information about the call. We already know the location of the incident. We already know what's going on there. So they're basically trying to skip ahead to see what the callers know in terms of the most recent information. They're going to want to know what's the condition of the patient how many patients there are, and the location of the shooter in the store. So as people are calling in and saying, you know, do you know where he is right now? And the caller says, no, I bolted out of there. That person as a source of information is no longer useful. So the 911 dispatcher says, okay, we've got help going that way to kind of truncate the call and move on. Because the phone's still ringing, there's more calls coming in. And it can be very difficult to know as you're taking multiple 911 calls, which one's going to be a good source of information. This is certainly true on active shooter calls, but it's true on any major incident. If you have a injury accident on a well-traveled road, the interstate or the like, you know, people will be calling in and many people are calling because they're frustrated, because they want to tell their story. They assume no one else has called. Uh, they feel like this is their big chance to dial 911. So people almost have like heroic feelings when it's time to call 911. Um, but you, as a call taker, you have to kind of process those calls and move on. There's actually a case... Um, should have looked this up a little bit more, but there was an active shooter 
And a 911 dispatcher is actually disciplined for hanging up on a caller at that scene because the caller couldn't talk. Um, I could look that up for more details on that when you cover the next thing, Drew. But um, as a 911 dispatcher, I totally understood that, that they would disconnect that call if that person wasn't giving them any relevant information because other calls are coming in with other information and you want to certainly get to those as fast as possible. So <clears throat> just to paint the picture, um of uh, and i'm trying to it was in evansville okay so just to paint the picture i don't know what evansville the jurisdiction um the police you know there i i think the evansville um or the indiana state police may may have been involved in helping out or whatever but just remember all of this as john told you is coming in at at one time and <laughs> You're going to hear dribs and drabs of information as both the radio dispatcher and as the, the officer that's responding to the scene. And you're going to hear just little dribs and drabs of information that are very important, but you don't remember where you heard them from. So when you get somewhere and you, you try to form up and you try to you know, make your, t your entry team or whatever, um, there may be information that you have that you're like, well, wait a minute, I thought he was on the west side of the store and somebody's going to give you something else. And neither of you can remember where that came from. This is all part of the chaos. If you'll remember when uh, I, I took my stand on Uvalde, which I still, to this day, uh, a lot of things I, I still hold true. I've changed uh, my opinion on some things, but not everything. Uh, not, not a lot, as a matter of fact. Um, it's the total confusion that's involved in this. Everybody knows in Uvalde, everybody knows in this Walmart, everybody knows in the target that we're going to talk about where the active shooter is because we see it on video. When you get there, when you, even, even Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, God, you know, God bless the, God rest the souls of the, of the people that were killed there. That is a, a, a multi acre campus. A Walmart is, you know, think of your Walmart. Uh, I know, John, it's probably been several decades since you've been in a Walmart, but um, think, of a, think of your Walmart or think of your Target and how big that place is. Now, the example I, 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 I would use from time to time when I was talking about Uvalde is um, just imagine you as a person walking into Walmart and, and walking directly to the dishes section where they have the, the fine china and um, you just r start ripping open boxes and dropping the plates from say shoulder height. And it, it's just plate after plate, after plate, after plate, after plate. And you just keep, you, you know, you've gone through your first box of eight. Now you're going to your second serving <laughs> your second box of eight. Think of how long it would be though. Everybody could hear that in the store. Think of how long it would be before the first Walmart employee approached you, first of all. Then, to put it in even greater perspective, think of how long it would be before the first officer got there. So even the first Walmart employee going there to see what's going on and calling 911 is going to create a delay in the officer's response. If you're lucky enough and they're two to three minutes away, they're still a minute outside gathering their gear, trying to get in and get to where the person is, what we'll call dropping the plates. There's a little substitution we can make here, and we'll say instead of dropping plates, we'll use shooting a gun, a handgun, a rifle, whatever. So these active shooter incidents, we always see so, so clearly through hindsight, are not as cut and dry as they are when we see them in hindsight. You see, or you heard just now, the confusion of several different people calling, giving several different accounts. The dispatchers were doing an amazing job at reassuring them that help was on the way, that getting help on the way, they, were, they did an amazing job at that. They, they did an amazing job at gathering information the best that they could, although I don't recall the descriptions, like getting the descriptions, but like, you know, the first caller right off the bat already had a name. They had their suspect, which is helpful for the latent part of this. It may not be helpful, helpful for the first officer there uh, because Ronald Mosley might be a different, it might be somebody they don't know. Ronald Mosley with the, uh, with the orange, the bright orange safety hunting cap on 
Well, now that's something a police officer can use. So these are these are things that you got to try to pull out of very excited people. And the dispatchers, the the 911 emergency call takers were doing an amazing job at keeping themselves calm to pull that information out of people. Well, it can be tough too. Not only are people giving you different information, but depending on the timeline of these phone calls, obviously the situation is still emerging. What actually happened inside the Walmart was is that this man entered with a firearm, went to the break room where he had at least four employees or possibly more. He lined them up against the wall, shot one of them in the face. One of those employees made a break for it. He went to go chase them. An employee still in that break room closed and locked the door, thus preventing him from returning and saving lives. And that's when the suspect went out into the sales floor where he was eventually met by police. So you have an involving situation there. It's not just one man in one place doing one thing. As these calls come in, you're trying to piece together, as I say, true crime in real time to figure out where he is, what he's doing, and unfortunately keeping track of how many people he's hurt. Um, how about, why don't we watch, um, oh, no, that's not the one I want. <laughs> Why don't we watch the police response to this? If I can. Um, and I lost it, of course. Um, so Evansville arrives on scene with several units. Um, they get ready for a, a tactical entry. What the chief later said was is this, and you can read this however you like, but we did not make a plan. We went into the building right away, as is our training. And you, we have body cam footage from several uh, police officers who are carrying the rifles and they're searching throughout the store. Now, anyone who's even played paintball before can tell you that uh, attempting to round corners and make your way without getting shot by somebody unseen is very difficult. And going through the store and not knowing where the person is in the store uh, and trying to clear corners and trying to, uh, you know, basically find out the areas of the store that he's definitely not in is a process of elim elimination to locate him is surely very difficult. I would not have wanted to be in that situation. No, uh, we are just a moment away from playing the video. Uh, so I know they had several several units go on scene there and they are not only, so it's crazy at the time because you also have people coming out of the building. And so they, they didn't get a description of the suspect so far as I could tell. Uh, they did get the guy's name, which we would come to find out later was someone that they had had contact with with before. Uh, he was someone who was previously employed by the store. He had actually been to court earlier that morning because he had several assault cases uh, still outstanding against many of the associates there. So obviously he's got a beef with them. From and the same Walmart. From the same Walmart. And so by getting that name, one thing that a dispatcher could do is they could run his driver's license. And there's ways of doing that where you can... I'm Go ahead, Drew. Push, let's push southwest. Yeah. Stack up, stack up, let's go. Female, female, female. Let's clear that. Right here. Clear this. Somebody hold that way.
Need one, need one. Push, push, push. Where's that last shot? Where the fuck's the electronic? Right back there. Down. Get the gun out. Drop it. Drop it. Drop it. Drop it. He's down. I'm moving up. Hold fire. Hold fire. He's down. All right. Uh, first of all, don't stop. Get it. Get it. That's the gorilla song that's playing in the background, which is kind of eerie. Uh, uh, and I do see that that uh, in the chats that that would probably ruin the song for a lot of people. And I, I get why it would ruin uh, the song. But, you know, it's almost a, a perfect soundtrack. And I say that just with a little bit of humor, because the woman who was shot in the break room, uh, as far as we know, she's doing OK, which I'm not sure how you get shot in the face and come out of that doing all right. I'm certainly certainly she's not OK mentally and she may not be physically, but I'm glad she's still alive. And then I have to say, too, I'm just very glad that no more no one else was hurt. He certainly intended to hurt many people. And I'm glad no police officers were hurt. As far as incidents go, it, it went pretty well. And I just want to draw attention to the fact that Evansville PD did a great job of going in there and, and stopping the threat. One thing that's often said is, particularly those who are against guns, you know, uh, is that guns are the problem. Well, anytime you have an active shooter, if you have a large body count, it's not gun violence that's the problem. It's not enough gun violence. You need police officers to go in there and respond in kind and to neutralize that threat. And unfortunately, you can only fight gun violence with more gun violence. And I appreciate the fact that Evansville PD went in there, they did their job, and they protected the community. It's very sad that this person uh, decided to take his life into his own hands by picking up a gun and going down to Walmart and deciding that he was going to start some trouble. But as I said, he made that decision for himself. Okay, so we'll get to the the, the scenario itself. Um, from what I read this afternoon, uh, this was some type of lover's triangle. Now, th this obviously differs from a, uh, this is more of a, a, a directed target kind of situation. Um, the Walmart, in my opinion, target, uh, literal target, the retail chain, um, and, and stores like that are soft targets. You know, they're very vulnerable to attacks like this. This was uh, very specific because this guy was apparently in love with the girl uh, who he shot. He was in love with her boyfriend, from what I read. So she did survive, and uh, she obviously has a long road ahead. But um, he shot her, and then he was on his way to shoot somebody else. What they recovered in his uh, house was a suicide. So he did, you know, he advanced towards law enforcement with a firearm in his hand. That's the shooting you heard. So obviously he tried to draw attention to himself by shooting the gun. And you saw the one officer going down one aisle and the other officer going down the other aisle uh, who subsequently neutralized him. Now think about that though. Um, when you're, and I see a lot of chatter too about active tr uh, shooter training. It's, it's phenomenal if you're able to on your, like on your downtime or on your night shift, get into a store that of that magnitude of that size and kind of creep around in there. Like as if you're responding to an active shooter, um, just because there are so many kind of hiding places, we're always told just go to the sound of gunfire and walk towards the threat uh, and keep firing until you, you know, whether you're taking rounds or not, just keep, keep firing until the threat is neutralized. But when there are so many aisles and bins and, places to hide and, and, you know, random gunshots and extra noise and weird songs. And, and you're in a Walmart and it's eerily quiet. And, you know, like, I don't know how to describe this, but I've been in a few situations where the volume is at like negative five. So 
you know, where you think, man, the volume is really low here. It's at zero. It's actually at negative five. Like you hear stuff that you shouldn't hear. Um, and I'm sure there's a phenomenon in, associated with that. But uh, those officers did a great job. They, they, they responded to the scene. They, they took the information of an active shooter. They went right in with their rifles and uh, they ended up, uh, you know, neutralizing the suspect. Um, and, and that was the conclusion the suspect apparently was looking for. Um, I, I will say for if you are a police officer and you have a Walmart, a Target, another store like that in your beat or a church or something like that, take time to go down there, familiar, familiarize yourself with the location of the camera room. I did loss prevention very, very early in what you would call my career at that point. And when I worked at Target, I can tell you that we had excellent camera coverage. We had certain strategies in place for our cameras where we had pan tilt zoom cameras where we could follow people all around the store. We would know if someone was in one corner and they walked all the way to the other side. And we had we had, we de developed camera strategies so that we could see people wherever they were at the store. If you had any kind of protracted incident, especially if you had hostages or anything like that, having one officer or someone that could go into the loss prevention room, into the camera room, would give you a huge tactical advantage in this situation. And certainly at a church like we had at the synagogue shooting down in Texas, a lot of churches will have an audio visual booth um, sometimes that stuff is accessible or usable, and that would be able to give you a huge advantage. And going down there before the incident is obviously going to give you the best advantage because you already know where those assets are at. Yeah, you use the technology to your advantage, obviously. I mean, it's the same thing with a shopping mall. If you, if you have some type of incident or active shooter in a shopping mall, get to the security room. And, um, you know, ch chances are they've got pretty much every square uh, inch of that mall covered with a camera somehow. Sometimes they're not working. Obviously, uh, usually it's the it's the camera you need, but uh, just get to the to the camera room. Um, yeah, in an active shooter, obviously, you know, run towards the gunfire. But if you if for whatever reason you feel like the cameras would be an advantage to you, and I don't know how long it took from the first time the police officer arrived on scene before contact with the suspect. And a Walmart's so big that you prob probably couldn't have enough police officers in there. Like you would want to send in as many as you could to be looking for the guy. But if you did have someone that could look at those cameras and get on the radio, you could ascertain the location of the subject and it would be a huge tactical advantage. The other two that we were going to get to, I don't think we're going to be able to get to them fully. So I, I think it would be a disservice. Maybe we can get them uh, to them on another show. One was the Omaha Target where the gentleman, uh, I won't call him a gentleman, where the guy walked into the target with an AR-15, um, ready to go, uh, and he, he pointed the gun at one target employee. He fired one or two rounds. I'm not, uh, I, I can't remember. It may have been multiple rounds. He, he fired a few rounds in the air, yeah, and uh, yeah. he at one point left the store and returned in what, if you wanted to deep dive that later, we can, but that was, that was a, a suspect precipitated homicide or suicide by cop. Yeah. I, I, I firmly believe that as well. And then there was one in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, which was a uh, Walmart, uh, a similar situation. It, it, by the way, the first guy, the, 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 the call that we just reviewed, um, he was an employee. I mean, that's how he knew all of those people anyway. And that's how he knew where to go. Uh, there was a Roanoke, Virginia Walmart, I think it was Roanoke, and uh, they, uh, the night manager um, had been working there since 2010 and just, uh, I don't know, Snap or whatever. Chesapeake, but, I think you mean? Yes, I do mean Chesapeake. That's where uh, I'm from. So confused with Roanoke and Chesapeake uh, and my favorite uh, Class A baseball team, the Jamestown Ghosts. Uh, but <clears throat> they, um, he he assembled everybody in the in the break room or he he knew what time they'd be in there like their shift starts at 10 he showed up and i i, I believe he killed five people uh before he was either before he killed himself or he was or he was neutralized but we'll do uh other um episodes i i am very interested in active shooter um response because um of what i want to show you next it's it's just kind of like it's a fact of life at this point unfortunately that uh you know when i was growing up as a kid we used to have uh, we, i was a kid i was a cold war kid we used to have air raid drills still uh where we'd have to get under our desks and uh you know like the nuclear fallout's about to happen um but i know that in the schools nowadays they have active shooter drills even in the elementary schools you know we, uh, our little guy here uh 
participates in those drills, I don't think they've completely told him what they are. Or they don't tell the students exactly what they are, but they do rehearse them and they, they practice them. Um, I do somewhere, I've got to find it, um, have footage of uh, Michigan. Um, University From of Michigan, there was a room Mi full of people. I got it right here. So this is this is this is not Michigan State or what is this? This is Michigan State. Okay. You're, you're on a roll tonight, John. No, Davis. I just want to make sure. No, you're 100 percent right. 100 uh, percent. Those, those guys, those guys in Michigan actually get kind of upset when you're not sure which you know state right, of State. University of Michigan you're talking about. All right, hang on. We're gonna go here. Uh, so this we is just last week or whatever it was when. Uh, do you remember the uh, active shooter incident there? I think it was last Thursday. Last yeah, Wednesday? I'm on the phone with the cops right now. The same place. Same place. Volume. Stop! 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 stop. So, again, our reality is that. Uh, let me get rid of this. Terrifying. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, I can't think of uh, our, our, yeah, our reality is that it's terrifying that that <laughs> these college kids um, have to endure that. First of all, but second of all, they're arguing amongst each other of how to handle things. But but you know what? I think you know they followed the instructions and that's a room full of people and, you know, hopefully that they would employ the run, hide, fight. Uh, and, th and that's an order of secession, by the way, just run. And uh, if you can't run anymore, then hide and fight. If worse comes to worse and he's there. You, you better fight, throw a chair, throw a garbage can, uh, do anything. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, none of us really know how we would respond in that situation, but I, you know, I, most of us would like to think that we would go down fighting, but the truth is we'd probably be terrified. I'm very uh, lucky that uh, kind of when I was going to school, when I was in high school, at least really the only example that we really had at that time that was sort of culturally defining in terms of school shootings was, was Columbine, which yeah. was, you know, um, sort of the, the OG school shooting thing, if you don't want to count Kent State. And, it, it, you know, that was sort of the, the gold standard of what – school shootings were and at that time we only had one and now there's so many that you can't even keep them straight you know if i talk to you about parkland or i talk to you about you know how many others are there it's a just very terrifying time for people in schools and i i feel bad for young people that this is the era they have to grow up in where they go to school and uh, they face this kind of violence but it's it's a symptom of cultural rot and unfortunately it's probably not going away anytime soon nope uh, until we change something in society. Um, I think that's kind of all I have. I don't know what uh, if you have anything else. No, I would like to talk about uh, suicide by cop in a future episode. That's something that's kind of changing a lot of the ways that we talk about uh, hostage negotiations. And uh, it's definitely a challenge for 911 dispatchers as, as it's becoming more prevalent. Um, I listened to a 911 call once from, uh, I believe it was in Dallas or a big city in Texas where someone dials 911 and he says, uh, yeah, there's a crazy guy and he's sitting in the middle of the intersection, you know, the intersection of, you know, fourth and grand or whatever. He says, there's, there's a crazy guy out there. He's out there with a gun. You've got to come kill him. And of course, that's such a bizarre thing to say in a 911 phone call. And of course it, it was the suspect himself dialing 911 on himself, demanding that a police officer. Uh, come out and, and shoot the the crazy person with the gun, and so it's sort of re it's redefining a lot of the things that 911 dispatchers have to do. When you know our response is normally to send a police officer out there to neutralize a suspect, like in these cases for the preservation of life, but that's all this uh, the man in Omaha and this particular guy in Texas. That's all they want is to go out there and 
and get killed. And so I'd be curious to pick your brain in the future of what our responsibility is towards someone who's willing to endanger your lives simply to end his own. It would be a lively discussion, no doubt. I hope you will join us uh, at that time. Uh, you can always leave us a vo voicemail, 848-266-6911, 848-COM-911. You can call us live when we're on the air live. Uh, listen, tell all your friends that this is going to be a, uh, a podcast come Saturday. Uh, that's what happens. We do this live Thursday nights, and then Saturday mornings, uh, the podcast fairy arrives and sprinkles his podcast dust on every podcast platform. And uh, it formulates this show. I apologize for right in the middle uh, that there was probably about three minutes of uh, body cam footage that we could not talk over because of an audio issue. But um, there was uh, the body cam footage from uh, the Walmart. I urge you to go to YouTube and check it out yourself just so you can see the tactics and uh, kind of get an idea of what that officer had to go through. Um, if there are uh, any voicemails during the week, I welcome them with open arms. John listens to them first two or three times. Then I scold him and then he re-listens to them and uh, vets them for me because. Uh, yeah, we got a, got a call from bone cold fleas, Austin, five minutes before the show started. And it takes a little bit of a uh, prep time for the show each week, folks. So if you leave us a voicemail at the 11th hour, it'll probably have to wait for next week, but we thank you guys for calling in, giving us voicemails and giving us calls. That's what drives this show is being able to involve other people. We encourage you to call in in the future. Well, for John JB, uh, the, uh, who can be reached at difficult to at difficult to look at pictures on Instagram, brilliant, uh, graphic artist. He is a, a brilliant sketch artist, maybe. Uh, myself, Drew at Drew underscore Breezy on Instagram, B-R-E-A-S-Y. Please look me up. Hope to have a great show prepared for you next week. Uh, till then. Good night. Oh.